To start off this video, I'll be telling you who will not appear on the list. Specifically Sylvanas and Arthas, or any of the people who have been Lich King, and for that matter, no Death Knights either. So pretty much just Undead Forsaken. And as for how I'll be ranking them, well that'll be pretty subjective on my part, based on how much I like them. So just sit back and enjoy a video on 10 Undead Lore characters you've probably never heard of that are either lore significant or have a weird claim to fame. Number 10, Gunther Arcanus. Gunther is a named undead character in the Undead Starting Zone, who is on a small island in the middle of a lake. There are mindless ghouls roaming about who will attack you on sight, but this NPC is friendly. You can't talk to him, and there are no quests associated with him. So just who is he? In Dalaran, there is a book that can be read called Losses of the Third War. In the book, it details the death of three mages during the Third War. On the second page, it mentions Gunther. Page 2. Gunther Arcanus, presumably killed during the events of the Third War and lost to the Scourge. Gunther was last in possession of my favorite pipe. Should his remains turn up, I would be most gracious for its return. In the third page of the same book, it details the death of a mage known as Bether Ishard. In the Magic Quarter in Undercity, you can find Bether right next to the portals and portal trainers, but you can't interact with him. Before Cataclysm, however, he did offer a small quest chain called the Lich's Identity, in which Bether sends you on a quest to steal the book from a Lich who is a free-willed Forsaken that broke free from Arthas on his own. Once you steal the book and give it to Bether, he recognizes the book as belonging to Gunther Arcanus, as they used to be friends before the Third War killed both of them. And he tells you that Gunther was a skilled necromancer when alive, and seems to be even better in undeath. So good, in fact, that Sylvanas would definitely want him on her side. So the rest of the quest is pretty much you trying to convince Gunther that there are other undead who broke free from the Lich King, and to join Sylvanas' Forsaken. So knowing all that, what makes Gunther so special? Well, let me emphasize a few points I may have mentioned casually. He is the only Lich in game that's not a floating skeleton monster. Liches are crazy powerful necromancers in lore, and only the best of the best can become them, with notable liches being Kel'Thuzad or Lady Death Whisper. Take this little quote from WoW Wiki. Typically, the Lich King elevates only necromancers to lichdom, but rumors speak of the occasional mage, shaman, or death knight who also attains the status. Some tales imply that a spellcaster with enough personal and magical strength can willingly turn himself into a lich. There's also the fact that he broke free from Arthas' will on his own. Pretty much all the other Forsaken broke free around the same time as Sylvanas when Arthas was weakened. But one can figure from context clues that Gunther was able to break free on his own at a time when no one else did, seeing as you had to prove to him that other Forsaken did in fact also break free like he was able to. Gunther could possibly be one of the strongest Forsaken, but since they removed the quest in Cataclysm, and haven't mentioned him since. I think Blizzard just kind of forgot about him. So he's probably not as strong as I'm hyping him up to be, and it's more likely that Blizzard just called him a lich by mistake or something. Number 9, Deathstalker Commander Belmont. During the Silver Pine quest chain, you leave him for dead with a pack of worgen coming after you. In haste, Belmont sends you away to safety with the Valkyrie as you fly out leaving him to fend for himself against a horde of oncoming worgen deep in enemy territory with no help. And he survives that, then becomes the quest giver for Shadowfang Keep and is currently hanging out in the Rogue Order Hall having a drink. So Belmont is a pretty badass rogue. If you've ever done the Silver Pine quest chain, which I highly suggest by the way, it's probably one of the best quest chains in the game, you know that many of the undead you come into contact with during the quest chain die. Lots and lots of death in the front lines of the Gildnaeus Offensive. So, it was pretty surprising to see that he was able to escape from all that madness, making him one of the better rogues in the entire game. Now let's go back a little bit and talk about Belmont in more detail. You first meet Belmont in Silverpine when he tells you to check up on one of his agents that he hasn't heard from in three days. When you meet up with his agent, you help her sneak into a secret meeting and discover that an alliance has been made between the Gilneas Liberation Front and the Bloodfang Pack. With this information, you go on various missions helping out with the war for Gilneas. Then later on in the quest chain, you meet Belmont again, and he has you help him look for Lord Vincent Godfrey's body to possibly recruit him to the Forsaken, 
as he will have some keen knowledge about the Worgen, seeing as he was a high-ranking person from Gildneus himself. After you recover Godfrey's body, you run away with the Valkyrie and leave Belmont behind, like I've mentioned previously, and that's the last you hear of him during the quest chain. If you then later make your way to Shadowfang Keep, he's the one who gives the quests, and one of his first lines of dialogue is, Did you think that a handful of Worgen vermin could stop me? Ha! Which, if you hadn't done the quest chain in Silverpine beforehand, would make it seem like what his escape from was no big deal. There were way more than just a handful of Worgen after him. Anyways, during the quest chain in Shadowfang Keep, you just go after target Belmont gives you, and after killing like the second boss or something, uh, High Warlord Chromosh jumps into the fray and tells them to stop using the plague. For those of you who don't know, even after the whole Wrathgate fiasco in Wrath, the undead have definitely not stopped producing and using the plague. Even though everyone tells them not to, including their own allies, the undead just kinda do it secretly now and hide all evidence when they do use it. So Chromosh asks why they're using the plague at the entrance, and Belmont tells them it's just a, a harmless, weakened version of the plague, only potent enough to scare off the worgen. After Chromosh leaves the room, Belmont will turn to you and thank you for keeping quiet about the plague because he knows damn well it's the real deal and not some weakened version. At the end of the dungeon, Chromosh is poisoned and Belmont holds off all attackers while you finish off the last boss with your group. The last time you interact with him is when you turn the quest in for killing the final boss. And Belmont wasn't seen again until Legion, having a drink with the Worgen Pirate in the Rogue Order Hall. With Sylvanas in charge of the Horde now, Belmont could possibly be making a return in some form. Number 8, Lord Vincent Godfrey. Now, Godfrey actually has quite a bit of story before he becomes undead. I could probably tell it all in detail, but I'm going to summarize it instead. Godfrey was a high-ranking person in Gilneas and advised Gen Gradmain personally. He was always kind of a dick and had a super hate boner for the Worgen. When the Forsaken started attacking Gilneas, Godfrey kidnapped Greymane in hopes of turning him over to the Forsaken as a bargaining chip. Greymane is then freed by a Worgen adventurer and Godfrey throws himself off a cliff deciding he'd rather die than serve a king who was a worgen. Then comes Commander Belmont during the Silverpine quest chain, who finds his body, and he's brought back to Sylvanas and raised as an undead. Since he was a high-ranking member of Gilneas, he's a pretty valuable asset to the Forsaken and their war on Gilneas, and is sent out on missions to help the war effort. During one of the missions, you as a player are sent into a village to help free some Forsaken troops who were in hiding and were afraid of the worgen rogues. After rescuing about two or three of them, Godfrey will then start shooting and killing them after you rescue them, calling them cowards and tells you to keep quiet about what he's doing. Around the same time, you go on a quest to put together a person's body to be raised again, after finding his head in a crock stomach. After being raised, he calls Godfrey a monster and gets shot. Godfrey just really likes shooting people. At the end of the Silverpine quest chain, after you kidnap the daughter of one of the Worgen generals and use her as a bargaining chip to get the Worgen to surrender, Godfrey shoots Sylvanas in the back, killing her, and then runs off to Shadowfang Keep. This is actually a pretty big deal, seeing as Sylvanas is like, you know, the war chief of the Horde now. Sylvanas was rezzed though by her Valks and became even more obsessed with death and not dying after that incident. After pissing off both the Alliance and the Horde, he plots his dumb revenge from Shadowfang Keep for some reason. And to no one's surprise, he's killed there. Number 7, Alexei Barov. Alexei Barov is a garrison follower from Warlords of Draenor, who likes to hang out in the lumber mill if you have the building, even though he can't be assigned there, and is one of the few followers that you can actually buy stuff from while he wanders around. But obviously, he's not on this list for being a garrison follower. He's on this list for having some history and being a garrison follower. Alexei Barov was one of the heirs to the Barov fortune. Before the Third War, the Barov family turned their home into a school of necromancy in exchange for immortality from Kel'Thuzad. The Barov family were then turned into servants of the Scourge, and Alexei Barov later broke free from the Lich King's grasp and joined the Forsaken. During Vanilla WoW, Alexei is a quest giver who will give you a quest to go into Skolomonts to collect four deeds that his family owns, since Skolomonts used to be his house. After you recover the deeds, he will then ask you to kill his brother, Weldon Barov, to secure his claim to the family fortune. His brother on the Alliance side asks Alliance players to do pretty much the exact same thing with Alexei. 
During the Cataclysm, Alexei stood next to his brother at the entrance to Skolomonts and would give you the quest to go in and rid his home of the Scourge, apparently forgetting that he had his brother killed in vanilla and vice versa. But after Mist, they disappear because Blizzard probably actually remembered their backstory and you run into them again in Warlords of Draenor. When you run into Alexei Barov, he's under a tree that you have to cut down. He'll then tell you that he and his brother decided to go into business together to plunder the New World's resources, but then they ended up betraying each other instead, and just like in the vanilla quest chains, they both ask for the other to be killed. Now, what sets Alexei apart from his brother is that Alexei actually appears on the Eastern Kingdom's loading screen from before Cataclysm. He is the undead guy in the top left hand corner. Number 6, Galen Trollbane. Galen Trollbane was the son of the much more famous Thoris Trollbane, warrior king of Stromgard during the Second War, who was easily the largest of all the kings of the Alliance at the time. Sometime around the Third War, he died mysteriously and his son Galen Trollbane took over. Then most of Stromgard was lost by Galen to the Syndicate and the Boulderfist Ogres, and things were not going too well for the new king. During Vanilla WoW, there was a quest to collect the sword known as Trollkalar from Galen Trollbane that required a long quest chain to unlock the tomb where it was held. And at the end of the quest chain, you need to kill Galen to collect the last key. Come Cataclysm, you learn that after you had given the sword to the troll quest giver, the troll was killed by Galen's troops when trying to leave Arathi. And the sword was put back into the tomb. Then Galen Trollbane himself was raised by Sylvanas and he sends you on a quest, as a Forsaken, to pretty much do the same thing as you did in Vanilla, and collect the sigils for the tomb to get the sword Troll Kalar, constantly remarking that he's only trying to get the blade so that it can be used for the Dark Lady. Then in Legion, you find out that as soon as Galen got his blade, he left the Forsaken and attempted to put his city of Stromgard back together as an entity independent of both the Horde and Alliance. Death Knights are sent to Stromgard during their Order Hall class campaign to ask Galen to open the tomb of his father so they can raise him as one of the four horsemen to fight the Legion. Galen will send the Death Knights on a few quests to clear out the last of the forest trolls in his kingdom to fully reclaim Stromgard in exchange for opening the tomb. But once you finish the quest, he attacks you, stating that he doesn't want to give Stromgard back to his father. Galen is, of course, defeated and the Death Knights raise his father and give him Troll Kalar. It's then that you find out why Galen really didn't want you to bring his father back. Because then everyone would have found out that he was the one who killed his father. And then his father joins the horsemen and does some other stuff and that's the end of Galen's story. Galen killed his father to take the throne quicker. Got killed in vanilla, raised by Sylvanas, tricked the Horde into reclaiming his sword, tricked the Death Knights into helping him reclaim his kingdom, and then died for a second time. Truly a great man. Number 5, Grand Apothecary Putris. One of the few Forsaken characters besides Sylvanas, even people who don't know a thing about lore, know about. Putris was part of the Apothecary Society in Undercity. The Royal Apothecary Society is a group of undead alchemists who create the plague the Forsaken use for most of their battles that's potent enough to harm both the living and the dead. Officially, the other Horde races think they're a society of undead alchemists looking for a cure to their undead illness. Which of course is not true, the undead just love chemical warfare. During the second Scourge invasion, Putris was able to find a cure for the plague, earning him the promotion to Grand Apothecary. When the Horde members got together to plan their campaign to Northrend to kill the Lich King, Sylvanas sent Putris to Thrall as she thought his knowledge of the plague would make him a very valuable asset to the war. Since you know, his plague could actually harm the undead, and chemical warfare is highly effective. Not that Thrall would ever condone it though. During the battle at the Wrathgate, right after the Lich King killed Dranosh, Putris, along with all the Forsaken who were loyal to Varimathus, unleashed their plague on everyone in the battlefield, the Lich King, Alliance, and Horde alike, then retreated to Undercity. For those of you who don't know or don't remember, Varimathris was a dreadlord working for Sylvanas all the way until the Wrathgate incident in Wrath of the Lich King. He was her right hand man and stood next to her in the throne room and even gave out a few quests to Horde players. It was always hinted that he was up to something and there was a secret saying in Undercity that there were actually two factions of undead, those loyal to Sylvanas and those loyal to the dreadlord. It was a pretty big reveal when the Wrathgate happened out of seemingly nowhere but the betrayal was hinted at subtly for some time. 
And as it turns out, Putris was Varimothris' right hand man. Players would then go with Sylvanas and Thrall into Undercity to reclaim it from Putris' rebellion, and both Putris and Varimothris die there. But Putris' betrayal at the Wrathgate is still one of the most infamous events in Warcraft history. <laughs> Did you think we had forgotten? Did you think we had forgiven? Behold now, the terrible vengeance of the Forsaken! Sylvanas. Death to the Scourge! And death to the Living! This is the hour of the Forsaken. Number 4, Meryl Felstorm. Meryl Felstorm is one of the few people in Warcraft lore to turn himself undead, making him neither one of the Forsaken nor the Scourge. Meryl Felstorm was originally Meryl Winterstorm. It is speculated that he is one of the original hundred human mages trained by the High Elves to fight the Trolls almost 3,000 years ago during the Troll Wars. For those of you who don't know the origins of the first human mages, back when the Troll Empire was still a huge threat, the High Elves, later known as the Blood Elves, allied themselves with the humans and as part of their alliance agreed to teach 100 humans how to use magic. It was thanks to these 100 human mages that they were able to surprise the trolls and defeat them. A defeat the trolls never really recovered from. Meryl Winterstorm was mortally wounded during this war and forced himself into undeath to keep on living. Well, as alive as an undead can be considered. And is the only surviving member of the council after Medivh became the last guardian and killed all the other members. Now here is where his story gets a little muddy. You see, Meryl plays a major role in the whole Medan storyline from the Warcraft comics. The problem with this is that it's still pretty in the air on whether or not Blizzard will make what happens in Medan's story canon or not. We have been getting lots of hints that Blizzard wants to forget Medan existed. But here's the thing with Meryl Winterstorm. During the comics, he takes on a powerful dreadlord inside his body, and kills someone when it takes over his mind before he could regain control. So Meryl renamed himself from Meryl Winterstorm into Meryl Fellstorm, since he had a demon in his body because of, you know, like, fell and shit. Then at the beginning of the Mage Class Order Hall missions in Legion, Meryl needs your help in defeating the dreadlord that was inside of him, because it got out somehow and attacked the Violet Hold in Dalaran. It is then up to the player to beat the Dreadlord, but he escapes, and then later poisons Meryl, but you help him get better, and finally do manage to imprison the Dreadlord in a soul stone. And then there's Garona, who in the comics asks Meryl to hide away her daggers so they may never be used again. And these daggers are the Assassination Rogue artifact weapons, which were confirmed to have indeed been hidden away by Meryl in game as well, making two parts from the Warcraft comics canon. And this is what I mean when I say the lore is a little muddy when it comes to the Warcraft comics and Medan's story. Because most of what happened is not canon, but some of it is. So it's hard to really know just how much of Meryl's story from the comics is canon or not. So I'll just leave his story from the comics alone at those two things that have been confirmed in game. So yeah, that's Meryl Felstor, a super powerful mage, one of the first human mages ever turned himself undead through his own power, one of the founding members of the Council of Tearsfall, and is almost 3,000 years old. He's a pretty important guy. Number 3, Alonis Fowl. Anyone playing a priest through Legion knows this guy quite well, but just what is his story before Legion? Why is he undead and why haven't players seen him in game before now? Well that's because the circumstances around his death are actually not very well known. After the First War, Alanis Fowl was already an old man and was at the council where Lothar told the Alliance of Lordaeron about the threat of the Orcs. 
For those of you who don't know much about the first or second wars, I'll give you a brief little rundown. The first war was between the humans of Stormwind versus the orcs, half of what happens in the Warcraft movie. The humans lose the first war, and Lothar takes all surviving members of Stormwind with him north to Lordaeron. Lothar then tells the other six human kingdoms that they had better unite if they don't want to lose to the Horde like the Kingdom of Stormwind did. And this is the birthplace of the Alliance we know of today, with the High Elves and Dwarves joining on a little bit later on in that war. And this is where Alonis Fal comes in. His history and the beginning of his involvement in the Second War are a little murky. Some sources say he was from Stormwind and came over to Lordaeron with Lothar, but others state that he was already in Lordaeron before Lothar showed up. But that doesn't really matter. What does matter is that he was the one who created the very first paladins in Warcraft lore, with Uther and Turalyon being some of the first paladins under his care. And Uther himself, the Hearthstone character for the paladin class, was his apprentice. What you probably don't know about the first paladins was they were just priests who were given combat training. They didn't know if these new battle priests would be effective against the Horde, but they needed to try it out since they were at a disadvantage against the Horde's massive numbers, ogres and warlocks, and it turns out they were really effective, especially against the Horde's new soldiers called the Death Knights. It's kind of funny how one of the founding members of the Knights of the Silver Hand hangs out with the priests in their order hall, and is one of their most important members. But then again, Alonis Fowl never actually became a paladin himself. He just converted some of his priests into them. Alonis Fowl was also the one to lead the ceremony in which Arthas became a paladin of the Silver Hand, and possibly Talon as well, Tyrion's son who died in Vanilla Wild. Then shortly before the Third War, Alonis Fowl died, presumably to old age, but it's also speculated that he was killed by the Twilight Hammer Cult. Whatever the case, he was then raised as a member of the Scourge and later freed himself and hid in the shadows, helping with things in the background. Funny enough, he helps the Alliance in the form of Moria, making him one of the few, if not the only undead, actively working to help the Alliance. It's doubtful the Alliance would ever let him join though, but he doesn't really care. He has more pressing matters to attend to, like helping priests get their artifact weapons. Number 2. Lillian Voss. Lillian Voss has got to be one of the most strongest undeads, and like Gunther, Meryl, Alonis, and other powerful undeads, isn't part of the Forsaken. There's just something about Sylvanas and her policies that just isn't attractive to the truly powerful members of the undead for some reason. Not to say that she doesn't have some powerful people under her though, as you'll see a little later on in the video. But back to Lillian Voss. You first meet her in Cataclysm during the Undead Starting Zone quest. As part of your introduction to the Forsaken, you're asked to help three other newly risen Forsaken to accept what they've become. Lillian is one of these three, and doesn't take to the news very kindly and runs off. You later have to show her a mirror so she can truly accept who she is, but then she just runs off again. A little while later down the Starter Zone quest, you'll run into her again, being held captive by the Scarlet Crusade. Which is a little odd for the Crusade as they usually kill all undead on sight and never take prisoners. When you go to the top of the tower she's held in and try to help her escape, well, she basically tells you to go away because she doesn't need your help. Then a high ranking member of the Scarlet Crusade will come to the tower and talk to her basically revealing that Lillian Voss was the daughter of the High Priest of the Crusade, and that he's disowned her for becoming what she was trained to kill, and that she should be put to death. Lillian, distraught over this news, promptly teleports out of her cage, kills the Scarlet Crusade member, and then teleports back into her cage. She wasn't kidding when she said she didn't need any help. Later on, towards the end of the Starting Zone quest, you start seeing dead bodies of Scarlet Crusade members with purple flames on them exactly like the flames Lillian used to kill her capturer. And on the corpse of one of the Scarlet Crusade members, you'll find a note stating that she's already killed 15 members of the Crusade, and a 1,000 gold bounty has been placed on her head. Then a quest giver will tell you to seek out Lillian to help her out, since she had come to him earlier looking for revenge against the Crusade. The quest giver will also remark that she probably won't even need your help, and would most likely have already killed all the Scarlet Crusade members herself, by the time you get there. And just like the quest giver said, when you get to the location of your meetup, 
it's at a camp full of corpses of Scarlet Crusade member. When you go to the tree where a Crusade member is hanging by his foot, Lillian will threaten you not to move and then whisper this to you. My name is Lillian Voss. Before I died, I was a member of the Scarlet Crusade. My father, High Priest Voss, raised me to be a weapon against the plague. I studied stealth, sorcery, martial arts, anything to make myself stronger. I gave up my childhood for him. Then, as fate would have it, I died and returned as... this. My father instantly forgot me and, when I returned, ordered me executed. Come, we will speak with him now, in his tower to the northwest. According to her, Lillian Voss is like a mage-rogue hybrid character, and a strong one at that, kind of OP. You then basically go with her while she kills all the crusaders on the way to meet her dad. And apparently, she can mass death grip as well as teleport to people's heads and set them on purple fire. She then finally has a reunion with her dad, after first killing two of his men in front of him. And they have a nice little talk before she murders him as well. And that's the last you see of her in the Undead Starting Zone. If you quest through the Western Plaguelands, you'll investigate a strange Scarlet Crusade camp that has been suspiciously taken out, with all the corpses having purple fire on them. Obviously the work of Lillian, signifying that she's not done with the Crusade just yet. In the Scarlet Hall's dungeon, Lillian will appear disguised as a hidden crusader and ask you to look for a book that has the names of all the Scarlet Crusade members. Obviously a good thing to have for someone who wants to wipe them all out. Then in the Scarlet Monastery, she'll ask you to grab the Anointed Blades and use them to kill High Inquisitor Whitemate, since she keeps resing members of the Crusade and it's inconvenient for her. After you do the deed, she'll take the blades for herself and head to Skolomont's, in an attempt to use them to kill the necromancer there, since apparently that's the only way to kill him permanently, and she also has a hate boner for necromancers, not just the Scarlet Crusade. When you finally make your way to Skolomont's, Lillian will help you out in one of the fights, and then be taken control of by the necromancer for the last fight. You don't actually kill her, but you do manage to free her from the necromancer's control and kill him, leaving Lillian severely wounded but alive. In Warlords of Draenor, Lillian will appear in your Lunafall Inn or Frostwall Tavern and have you kill necromancers in Doom for a blade. And that's the last you hear from her. Number 1. The Thanos Blightcaller Anyone who's Horde who's quested through Stormheim should know who this guy is. But do you know what he was up to before Legion? Nathanos Maris was the only human to ever reach the rank of Ranger Lord in the High Elf Ranger system with only Sylvanas Windrunner herself having a higher rank than him. Kel'thas was very opposed to the idea of having a human serve in the ranks of Ranger Lord, and asked Sylvanas on many occasions to banish him from the Order. During a vanilla quest, Nathanos will send you to find a book called the Kel'thas Registry, which is written by Sylvanas herself, that reads, Kel'thas Sunstrider's dissension in regards to my decision to allow Nathanos Maris into the Order is noted. It should also be noted that Nathanos, although a human, is one of the most gifted rangers I have ever had the pleasure of training. For millennia, we have isolated ourselves from the outsiders. I will be the first among us to admit that mistakes were made in the past. Humans never should have been exposed to magic. I will not deny this, but I will not condemn us to this guarded existence for the blunders of our predecessors. There is much that a coexistence between the Queldorai and other races of the world can bring we must practice tolerance. It is with these words, then, that I deny Kel's request in regards to Nathanos Maris. He will prove to be an invaluable ally, mark my words. Signed, Sylvanas Windrunner, Ranger General of Silvermoon. It's pretty obvious from the writing that Sylvanas has a high opinion of Nathanos, and is speculated that maybe there was something more to their relationship. After all, her two sisters did both end up marrying humans so it's not too far-fetched. During the events of the Third War, Nathanos died and became a member of the Scourge. When Sylvanas freed herself from the Lich King, she also sought out Nathanos and freed him as well, turning him into her champion. Like all undead, Nathanos has a fanatical devotion to Sylvanas. In Vanilla, King Varian Wren and Bolvar Fordragon will send Alliance players on a quest to track down and kill Nathanos. Since Nathanos was an Alliance hero, Stormwind sent some SI7 agents to see what happened to him, seeing as his body was never found. 
Of the group sent, only one agent returned, mumbling madly about Nathanos and the word Blightcaller. To kill Nathanos at the time required a small raid group of almost 10 people. He was a pretty tough beast to take down for a quest that didn't involve a raid or a dungeon. Of course, later on in WoW's lifespan, Nathanos will remark that he escaped the whole situation with the Alliance by feigning death, and becomes a hunter trainer in Undercity when undeads were allowed to become hunters in the Cataclysm. Then come Legion, with Sylvanas' rise to Warchief. The average player might be wondering who this guy called the Champion of the Banshee Queen is, and why is he so devoted to Sylvanas to a fanatical degree during the Stormheim quests? Well honestly, his fanaticism for Sylvanas is pretty common amongst the Forsaken. Sylvanas is more like a superstar or demigod to the Forsaken than a leader, and they all act like crazy diehard fans when it comes to her. Nathanos is no exception to this. Whether or not there's hidden meaning to that is all speculation, but it could be something else as well. With the quest in Stormheim, Sylvanas goes missing when the Worgen attack, and it's up to you, Nathanos, to look for her, while at the same time killing lots of Worgen as payback. You eventually do find Sylvanas, and she's doing A-OK, -okay, just being her normal, kinda evil self. And that's it for the video. Nathanos might have more to do in Legion, so I'll just leave his story alone at that. I hope you enjoyed the video, it took a long ass time to research everything.